Hello, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave with Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. On today's show, we're going to take a deeper dive beneath the layers of plants. We're going to talk about creatures that live within creatures and get even deeper into the chemistry of the creatures that live in creatures. And I've got the perfect person for this topic on the line today. I have Dr. Nick Oberlies. He has a PhD in medicinal chemistry and pharmacognosy from Purdue University. And today he is the Patricia Sullivan Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. He's also the current president of the American Society of Pharmacognosy. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Nick. It's great to see you. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess to start off, why don't you give us a little bit of background on what is pharmacognosy anyhow? What is that? Yeah, great. So many years ago, when I was probably less than 30, I was giving a talk somewhere and somebody introduced me as the last of the dinosaurs because I was the last pharmacognosist, one of the last pharmacognosists that graduated from Purdue. They changed the name of their department and all that. But pharmacognosy is one of the disciplines of, I guess you would say the sort of the realm of pharmacy. And it effectively means the study of bioactive materials from nature. And the term pharmacognosy really derives from Greek um, you know, no see obviously means knowledge and pharmacon, mm-hmm. you, you could define it two ways. One is it's pharmaceutical, right? Pharmacon sort of sounds like pharmaceutical, but really it probably translates more to the term plant in Greek. And so if you had a knowledge of plants, you were a pharmacognosis. And by having a knowledge of plants going back two or 300 years, as you well know, you had a knowledge of how people could be healed. Right. And so pharmacognosy still exists. People call it many different things. I often tell people that I study natural products chemistry because I effectively study the chemistry of nature. But to do pharmacognosy specifically, it would mean you study the bioactive materials that are the chemicals of nature. So the things that plants use to protect themselves from other plants, the things that plants use to protect themselves from insects, the things that fungi use to fight for their little piece of turf. All of those things are kind of like chemical warfare, and we try to unlock that. Wow. Well, and you you just mentioned something that's long fascinating me, and I, I've I've not yet tapped into this, but I'm I'm just blown away by the intricacies of these dynamics, and that's the plant fungal relationships, mm. right? We know that fungi are all over the world. They're in the soil, they're wrapped around plants, but they're also inside of plants. And I know you've done a lot of work on medicinal plants, and especially with milk thistle. Can you tell us a little bit about your work on milk thistle and what role have fungi played in the chemistry of milk thistle? Yeah, it's great. I'd be happy to. So I, I've listened to other of your podcasts, and I, I've, I believe in a previous episode, you talked about um, the gut microbiome and that this mm-hmm. idea that, yes, we're humans, but we have more bacteria in us than we do you know, mammalian cells. And that affects all kinds of things about us. And the same is true for plants in the environment, that, that they have organisms inside them, sometimes bacteria, sometimes fungi. And a lot of times, um, those fungi are completely, uh, what's the word? They're, they're, they're not causing any problems. They're not pathogenic. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're very possibly there to help the plant, right? So there's this like symbiosis between them. And there's debate about this. And so if you start taking plant material and... Um, you take it back to the laboratory, you put it in the lab, and you try to grow the fungi that come out of it, you'll find a whole bunch of other species of plants, um, some of which are possibly there to decompose the plant material, right? So Mm. a a leaf falls off the tree, it hits the ground, it's not sitting there for 6,000 years like a piece of granite, it's being decomposed. And sometimes it's the fungi that are just kind of hanging out inside the plant that are waiting for its chance to decompose. But other times, that fungus might be making bioactive metabolites, or the interaction of that fungus with the plant is stimulating bioactive metabolites, maybe in the fungus or in the plant, to protect itself, probably from herbivores or insects or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So with specific to milk thistle, what we've done, so we've, we've studied the chemistry of milk thistle for a long time. Milk thistle, y- your, your listeners probably know that if, um, if you've messed up your liver, because over COVID, you've drank way too much liquor. <laughs> or Not you, guilty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, or you've got hepatitis, or you've eaten a poisonous mushroom. Um, 
milk thistle is one of those herbal remedies that I think kind of straddles the line between uh, folk medicine and proper pharmaceutical. If you're in Germany and you poison yourself because of eating, let's say, a poisonous mushroom, they will prescribe to you a preparation of milk thistle that seems to um, regenerate your liver, for lack of a better term. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I could get into the weeds of that, but I'm not going to get into the weeds of the pharmacology. But what we have done is study the chemistry of that for many, many, many years. And there's basically a suite of about seven or eight compounds that are called flavonolignans. I could draw you the structure if you want. Maybe <laughs> I'll send you the structure. But uh, flavonolignans seem to have hepatoprotective properties, right? So liver protecting. Liver yes. protecting, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a famous study um, where a family uh, in California, I believe, was out collecting mushrooms. And they brought them back to their house and they put them in the refrigerator. And unfortunately, somebody cooked them and put them in the meal. And I think it was a, a family of four plus the grandmother. Mm -hmm. And they ate a poisonous mushroom. I think it was potentially an Amanita species. And so these people are like on their deathbeds. And the FDA got uh, emergency approval to send over an intravenous formulation of, of milk thistle. It's approved in Germany. It's not approved in the United States. And they gave it as rescue therapy to this family. And four out of the five survived. Unfortunately, the grandmother, probably because she was the oldest, did not survive. But at least the other four did. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it seems to really work, right? Um, yeah. So what we've studied then is what's going on then in this in this plant. Like, is there other things in there, right? And and we have isolated. Um, uh, it's kind of complicated, but we've isolated fungi that live inside the plant tissue, and some of these fungi indeed actually produce flavonolignans. And it's debatable. Some people will say, well, are the flavonolignans produced by the plant or the fungus? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to go as far as to say that they're produced by the fungus instead of the plant. I think there's plenty of evidence that they're produced by the plant. But there's potentially some horizontal gene transfer. So the genes that make those compounds are being transferred into the fungus, and they can make them as well. That's um, amazing. I know so, you're interested. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I'm just, I'm thinking of this from a perspective of traditional medicine too, because, you know, um, milk thistle or syllabum marianum in the Asteraceae family, I have to get my botany geek on here, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Hey, do, you, do you know the uh, the authority? Oh, <laughs> oh no, I don't. Oh, that's okay. We'll, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but syllabum. Yeah. And it's this beautiful, gorgeous, tall herb. Very yeah. spiny, very thorny. You don't necessarily want to go and you know collect a uh, a bouquet of these plants because they exactly. will you know really leaves and stuff are spiny. Um, but it's amazing to think of something that's just a, a weed in the Mediterranean has this long history of traditional use, and now today, as you're saying, you're understanding the microbiome of the plant itself. So yeah. the plant plus all the stuff that grows on or in it. Um, are responsible for these activities. Um, that's just amazing to me. Yeah. 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 Further to what you were saying, like, I, you know, for many, if you think about herbal remedies, there, there are, um, there are some organizations that worry about uh, herbs that have been over harvested from the environment, right? That they're mm -hmm. endangered species. I think uh, ginseng falls into that where I live in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, milk thistle is not one of those. I was in, <laughs> uh, I was in the country of Jordan once and we were wandering through the Jordan Valley, which is, a uh, very rich source of agriculture. And all of a sudden I'm looking at this plant that's like chest high to me. I'm about five, nine, five, ten, And I realize like, oh, that's syllabin marianum. And it's just growing along the edge of the, of the, uh, of the fields. In fact, I think in some States, they really don't want you to grow it in the, in the United States because those seeds. So they're like these little tiny, um, what are called akines, and they kind of blow across the field almost mm -hmm. like milkweed, and suddenly you've got milk thistle everywhere. So yeah, it, it, it's it's more noxious weed. In fact, a lot of the the literature, the chemistry literature, some of it's on like the medicinal properties, and some of it's on the noxious weed properties of milk thistle. But that's I love weeds. I think weeds. When you have a weed that's also a medicinal plant, there's usually some pretty interesting chemistry happening there. Um, yeah. 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 So how do you get, how do you isolate? You mentioned that you isolate fungi, bacteria from plants. How do you go about doing yeah. that? How do you know uh, I'm glad you asked. Inside the tissue or on the surface? Like how do you yeah. differentiate that? I am so glad you asked. That's one, we really like to geek out on this. So, yeah. um, 
to isolate endophytic organisms. So epiphytic would be they grow on top. Endophytic means they grow inside. And so, um, you know, a milk thistle leaf might be about that big. And we would bring it back to the lab and we would want it fresh. You have to have fresh species. And we would um, surface sterilize it. So we, I think there's a three-step procedure. We basically dip it in a little bit of ethanol and water. I think we even potentially wipe the surface with a little bit of bleach. Basically kill anything on the surface. Cut it up into small pieces. So we're talking about pieces that are about a centimeter, about the width of your finger. And then we'll put them on a Petri dish uh, that might have uh, like a rich agar medium. And we let it sit. And uh, I could even share some photographs with you on this. If you, you mm -hmm. let it sit for a little period of time, if you can envision like a stem, a stem might look like a little straw. After maybe one or two weeks, suddenly you'll get some like growth coming out of the, the ends, right? And then I have a mycologist, an excellent mycologist that works in our team. And he will then go underneath the microscope and isolate the fungi as they grow out. Oftentimes it's one species. Uh, sometimes it's a mixture of species that grow out. And really what we do, it, it's it's a little bit of trial and error. We're gonna take like, like a stem, like the size of a straw, cut it up in a bunch of one centimeter pieces, put them on a bunch of Petri dishes and let them incubate and wait and see what grows out. You talk about weeds, you know, you mentioned weeds from a plant perspective. There's also weeds from a fungi perspective. So the weedy organisms grow the fastest and they come out first. Not surprisingly, the weedy organisms are often penicillium species, which mm -hmm. led to penicillin. Uh, they're aspergillus species, which are like common molds. But sometimes we're going to want to let it grow for a longer period of time till we get something kind of odd growing out of it. Oh, interesting. In fact, with our, our milk thistle work, speaking of penicillium, uh, we did a study where we were looking for antimicrobial properties, actually, um, to sort of thwart drug resistance, AGR drug resistance, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, we isolated penicillium species. It turns out it wasn't new to science. Somebody else had also isolated it from like a well in Japan, right? <laughs> so this is the funny thing. Like there are some... There are some endophytes, and there's debate about this in the literature. Are the endophytes obligate, meaning that they have to grow with that species? And this mm -hmm. is kind of known in some grasses. There are grasses that uh, sometimes animals will graze on and it'll make them crazy. Um, and those those weeds have endophytes that are kind of obligates inside those, those grasses. There are other endophytes. Spores fly around the world. They don't care about geopolitical borders, and they'll just land on a plant. And if it's a good place to grow, it'll grow. So I don't think we've done enough sampling yet with milk thistle for sure to know are the fungi that we've isolated, were they obligate to the species or were they, they just happened to be there. Um, but either way, they did cool chemistry. And so we were excited. That's great. Well, and tell me, what are some of the different types of biological assays that you're doing in your group? You mentioned antimicrobial assays, but I think you're also doing some work with cancer, right? Oh, yeah, correct. So our, our, mm -hmm. our main, our, our largest funded project from the National Cancer Institute is a grant to look for anti-cancer drug leads from fungi. And this is the interesting thing. So I, I hope your, your pharmacology geeks on the podcast know that penicillin comes from a fungus, right? And And you can make a pretty good argument that 40% of the people listening to your podcast would not be alive today because their their mm -hmm. parent or their grandparent or their great-grandparent died of some disease that today we would consider innocuous, right, because of antibiotics. Um, so that's the most famous of all the um, fungal metabolites. Other fungal metabolites, lovastatin, so if you've ever taken the statins because of a heart condition, those are originally derived from fungi. Uh, immunosuppressants like cyclosporin derived from fungi. There's a mm -hmm. drug used to treat fungal infections, um, it, it's derived from fungi. So there's a whole bunch of m drug metabolites. I mean, they came actually FDA approved drugs that came originally from fungi. Interestingly, cancer is one of those, right? We have not oh, discovered wow. anti-cancer. Yeah. And, okay. and there's a couple that are kind of working their way through the pipeline. There's, there's some metabolites that you know, broadly defined might fit, but if like a proper, like kind of as we would with Taxol, Taxol is kind of one of the most famous plant metabolites that became a drug. We don't really have that in the fungi world. And so our project is to examine fungi for anti-cancer drug leads. And mostly what that means is we grow cancer cells. 
we have a collaborator who does this and she grows mm -hmm. cancer cells and culture. In particular, she's focused on ovarian cancer mm -hmm. and will take dilutions of an extract of a fungus and test them against the uh, cancer cells and, and see if they die. And the interesting thing is if we test, so I should back up. We have a collaborator who has a library of about 50,000 fungal species collected from all over the world. Oh, right? wow. Now, these are not necessarily endophytes. They're from a whole bunch of different locations. Mm -hmm. But um, And his library of fungi have been tested for many, many things. Herbicides. In fact, he's got an herbicide in development. Herbicides, insecticides. You know, you can go down the list. Mm -hmm. uh, we're the first one to really systematically go through them for anti-cancer drug leads. And what we'll do is if we test about 100 samples, 100 different fungi, only about 5 to 10% of them will kill cancer cells. And so once we figure that out, 5 to 10%, we then take those ones that are active. And there's a whole bunch of geeky chemistry stuff we do to prioritize them and then try to isolate the molecules so that eventually they can be anti-cancer drug leads. Well, let's back up because this is interesting to me, and I think it might be to some of the listeners too. Is So you have this library of fungal cells, and let's say you take a fungus out of the freezer how do you go from that fungus to an extract of the fungus? Oh, do you, I yeah. mean, are they easy to grow or how difficult is it to cultivate these organisms yeah. to get the Great chemistry question. out? Great question. So uh, not all of them are easy to grow. Uh, a lot of them, um, in fact, the ones that are harder to grow are sometimes better because as I said, the weedy ones, you know, you can get mm -hmm. mold on your bread. That's usually an aspergillus or a penicillium species. Um, so we're often looking for the rare ones. Um, his library was originally built up on fungi that were slow growing. So they kind of threw away the fast growing ones because they were kind of weedy and focused mm -hmm. on the slow growing ones. So they're stored at room temperature on slants. Oh, I wish I had a picture of a slant, but a slant is like a test tube that's got agar grown on it kind of at an angle. And you put the fungus there and you let it, it's sort of like suspended animation. It can live for five to 10 years in this state. And then for our studies, what we do is we pull them out. We we have ways that we probe his library based on country of origin, based on substrate that it was collected from. Uh, we once used a random number generator to just collect them at random. We then sort of bring them back to life. So you put them on a Petri dish with some rich media. The rich media could usually like a potato or a rice-based media, something called PDA, potato dextrose agar. And they start to grow and they'll make these nice circles like a fungus grows. And then what we do, now this is the important point, to do anti-cancer drug discovery, what we then want to do is grow a larger amount of this. And so we will kind of cut out a little piece from the growing edge. We'll transfer it to a liquid medium. The liquid medium is just to create a bunch of mycelium. I often joke, this is like giving somebody Coca-Cola, right? You want to make them big and fat, have them drink Coca-Cola every day. Maybe I shouldn't say that since you're from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they 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 make a, a large amount of mycelial mass, and then we dump that liquid on top of a solid substrate. And the solid substrate is one of the most consumed foods in the world, which is rice. Um, it's autoclaved rice, so it's like cooked rice. We pour that material on top of there, so now it's got this solid, goopy mass that it has to decompose for its food source. Right. And so fungi, so fungi are um, eukaryotic, just like humans, but their stomach is on the outside. So they're secreting enzymes to sort of decompose the material that's around them. And so for them to decompose this rice, they've got to turn on the biosynthesis of a bunch of enzymes. And we believe that by turning on the biosynthesis of enzymes, they also then turn on the biosynthesis of what are called secondary metabolites or what you and I might call natural products. And we find that if we, if we force the fungus to decompose something for its food source, we get a much more robust hit rate, meaning we can replicate the biological activity, right? We let that grow for about six weeks. And I should be clear, we don't always use rice. Sometimes we use oatmeal. Sometimes we buy cereals. We've even used Cheerios, uh, different kinds of cereals, uh, you know, like Honey Nut Cheerios, other things like that. That was invented by a colleague of ours up in in Oklahoma, but it works pretty well because you can buy Cheerios and it's always the same, right? Anyway, you've, you've forced the fungus to decompose the rice or the Cheerios or the oatmeal, and then you simply pour solvents in there like alcohol, shake it up, evaporate it, and you've got an extract. Wow. 
And I know with plants, the secondary me metabolite profile of a plant can be super complex, hundreds, if not thousands of different metabolites. What's it look like under the hood for a fungus? I mean, are, yeah. are we looking as complex or... Yeah, that's a that's a great question. No, it's not as complex. That's one of the great benefits of fungi. Uh, you're absolutely right because I've worked on plants. There's there's scores, if not hundreds, of compounds. In a fungal extract, we probably find somewhere between five and thirty peaks as we start to do the purification. Uh, and and five to fifteen is pretty common. And so what we're often doing is just so with a plant, you might do a couple rounds of bioactivity-directed fractionation. We'll do at least a round of bioactivity-directed fractionation, make sure that we've got the activity, and then we'll just isolate everything. We'll isolate all the metabolites and hopefully get a little bit of a structure-activity relationship based on what is active in the biological assay. That's great. Very cool. And so for your, for your isolation strategy, do you have a standard way that you typically like isolate? Um, do you like liquid, liquid partitioning or HPLC oh, yeah. or what, what do you do? Yeah. So the first step is always liquid, liquid partitioning. Um, we want to get it down to an organic sample. So basically what we'll do is we'll take the extract and we'll shake it with, uh, something that's very, um, uh, hydrophobic, like hexanes. We want to, get, so, so fungi are full of fats, just like human cells. Mm. There's like ergosterol instead of cholesterol. So we want to pull out all the ergosterol, mm -hmm. which is found in fungi. We'll then also usually partition it with water to get all the sugars and salts out of it and really focus on that median level polarity. We then do normal phase chromatography followed by reverse phase chromatography. And usually right. it's about three rounds and we can get to a pure compound. And, and what the, the key is we, um, very early in the process, we're working on the what we call the small scale. So, uh, you know, the size of a coffee cup growth. But once we have a hit, one of the things I like to pride myself on is that we can scale it up and get it up to the gram scale. I That's mean, I was, amazing. That's yeah, a challenge for plants, right? Because if we have challenge. some small herb that occurs very rarely, it's really, you know, scaling up for larger production for even for lab studies can be really difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I kind of use the argument that we should at least be able to get to a gram because once you get to a gram, you can do a lot of things. You can give, you know, if you, if you tell the pharmacologist, well, I always joke that if you call up a pharmacolo pharmacologist, calls you up and says, oh my goodness, this is really active. And they'll say, I need some more. And they'll ask, okay, how much do you need? Uh, 10 milligrams. 10 milligrams in the in early stages could be 20 to 50 times the world supply, right? The, <laughs> the world supply right. might That's be right. about you know, 200 <laughs> micrograms, right? But, but I never tell them no. I just say, okay, give me a few <laughs> weeks, right? And I tell the students, Go to 10, go to 100, go to 1,000 milligrams, right? And once you get to 1,000 milligrams, you can start to collaborate with synthetic chemists, and they'll start to decorate the molecule with different things to make it more water-soluble or to target it. You can do in vivo studies. Um, there's a lot more things you can do once you get it to a gram. So it seems to me that the gram is like this threshold mentally that people need to get past, even though we can solve the structure with 300 micrograms, right? A third of a milligram, we can solve the structure, but no one's gonna care unless you can put it in their hands. So let's let's geek out a little bit more and talk structure solving. All right. 300, 300 micrograms is a tiny amount of pure compound. How are you doing that? Like what's what's your equipment look like? Um, okay, so we've got it. We're gonna purify it. Um, it's gonna be greater than 95% pure as validated by UPLC, ultra mm -hmm. high performance liquid chromatography. We are then going to mass spec. I was joking, we mass spec the bejesus out of something. <laughs> like uh, and that's the thing that's really changed in my research group. Um, as you know, I, I collaborate with our close colleague Naja Check, and I came to UNCG about about a de 10 years ago and up until that time, I would have said that a natural product chemist did NMR, 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 and then some mass spec. Yeah. <laughs> and now my lab does mass spec. Like if they would let us use the mass specs all day, every day, we would. <laughs> very, very powerful technique. Many of my students have gotten jobs in mass spectrometry uh, after working here. But so we'll do mass spec and we will we have a database of about 625 metabolites that we've isolated from fungi that we're always checking things against. Um, sometimes we want to, let me give you a good example. Like you were asking about scaling things up. There's one drug lead that we're working on where 
up until about four years ago, I would argue that the world supply was probably five megs. Mm -hmm. And we had, this is the benefit of having a collaborator who has 50,000 fungi. We had 12 different strains that all made the compound. So then we had to figure out which strain makes it the best and how could we mm -hmm. optimize the growth. And I, and I always joke, even if they've got the same genus and species names, it's like humans, you know, I love basketball, but I can't dunk. It, I mean, you know, unless yeah. you lower the rim. And even then I can't call them a basketball, but there are human beings, same genus and species who can like take off from the, from, from the foul line and do it. And so same way with fungi, some fungi produce the compounds better than others. So, um, wow, where was I going with this? Okay. So we're going to like optimize the production. We're going to try to get it more material, but even with 300 micrograms, we bang things against the database, see if we can figure out the structure. And if we cannot, then we do uh, one and two dimensional NMR, including COSY, HSQC, <laughs> HMBC, uh, NOSY correlations. Um, and the, the great thing is at, at UNC Greensboro, we've got a 700 megahertz NMR with a cryoprobe, which oh, nice. allows us to go really deep into the structure elucidation with a That's small great. amount of material. So. Well, we have that enough for you. That's it's super geeky, <laughs> and I'm going to ask you just to clarify a few things because, yeah. believe it or not, we have not had a guest to go into detail on NMR yet on the show. Yeah. So, yeah. what what does NMR stand for, okay. um, and how does it kind of work from a general perspective? We talked about mass spec um, on a recent episode, actually, with with Nadja, and okay. so I'm like, can you walk us through what is NMR? How does it work? Yeah. So. Um... So if you think about different techniques, so there's all kinds of techniques to solve a structure. You can like figure out how they absorb light. You can figure out what they do in a mass spectrometer. And you can figure out what they do in a magnet, right? And NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. So with every other technique in analytical chemistry, you can measure certain properties of a molecule, but it's hard to figure out how they're connected, right? And the great thing with NMR and when we say NMR, we're typically talking about proton or carbon-13 NMR. You can start to figure out how different atoms are put together that makes the larger molecule. Um, if any of your listeners have had an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that's basically what they're doing to the human body on a much larger scale, okay? They changed the, the term, they, they got rid of the term nuclear when they wanted to use it with humans. There's no, there's no radiation, we're just talking yeah. about the nucleus when we say nuclear, but the way it works is uh, if you align atoms in a magnetic field, they interact with each other and they're influenced by their environment. Um, and we often, I often jokingly say in my class on this that, that we're interested in coupling. So how is this proton coupled to the next proton, coupled to the next proton? And every coupling depends on the environment. And I joke, it's like, you know, it's like if you're married, like you cannot help but be influenced by your spouse or mm -hmm. your children. Or your in-laws, right? <laughs> they are, or your brother-in-law, or your sister-in-law, whatever, right? So all of those couplings matter, and they're you can they're um, well defined. So something that's near an an oxygen is supposed to show up in a certain region. Something that's near a nitrogen is showing up in a different region. And you can use all those things then to sort of backtrack out and figure out the structure. So you're kind of inferring the structure using NMR. That's awesome. So it's like a guide almost to putting together this puzzle piece of how each of these parts comes together. Yeah. The end. Nice, nice. Yeah. In fact, I often tell students that if they're good at solving a puzzle, um, they might enjoy NMR. Um, and and it's, it's like a lot of different kinds of analytical techniques. It's hard to prove it right, but you can do different steps to prove yourself wrong. And so you just keep going until you can no longer prove yourself wrong. I kind of like Sudoku. They need to have an like an NMR version of yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, there, I mean, there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. yeah. The gold standard for all of that stuff, though, is is always X-ray X-ray crystallography, so that you can get like a picture. So I always tell people that like X-ray crystallography would be like if somebody is robbing your house and you have a webcam turned on and you see the photograph of them robbing your house. That's X-ray crystallography. NMR is more like they left fingerprints. And so then we take the fingerprints and we mm -hmm. sort of analyze the fingerprints or we take a DNA sample and we analyze the DNA sample and we kind of work backwards and say, yes, you're the guilty party, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the difference. That's great. I like that. I like that analogy. Yeah. Um, we've, we've just started our own foray into X-ray crystallography. I love it. It's so exciting because it's like you get this beautiful 3D image of your molecule in space and that it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I always tell people that like when it comes to, I mean, I've never run an X-ray instrument, but I've, I've used the data and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the most influential papers from the 20th century is the structure of DNA and X-ray X-ray data was key to that, right? So yeah. even here in 2020, 70 years later, it's still a very, very key aspect. So, yep. cool. Well, and one other thing that you mentioned about optimizing your strains for your scalability. I mean, that's what happened also with penicillin, going back to the example oh, yeah. of penicillin, right? They had to find. Oh, yes. Let me, can I recommend a book? Am I allowed to make book recommendations? All right. If you're, if your listeners are wanting to read a book about penicillin, there is a book called The Mold in Dr. Flory's Jacket. And Flory, so people often attribute the discovery of penicillin to Alexander Fleming. And Fleming made the initial observation of a fungus interacting with a bacterium, and this bacterium is dying. But Flory and his team is the one who figured out the structure of penicillin. And if you're ever feeling down in the dumps because you're writing grants and it's the middle of COVID and God, isn't this hard to do science this way? Flory and his colleagues were working on the structure of penicillin and isolating enough penicillin to give to humans while London was being bombed during World War II. So the mold in Dr. Flory's jacket refers to the fact that they had lab coats that they impregnated with the spores. So if they ever had to scuttle the labs, they could escape the country with their lab coats and then take them somewhere else. So, you know, penicillin, if you, if you look at the initial studies on that, I mean, people made Herculean efforts to grow enough material to treat one person one time. Right. And today, um, my colleague, um, I have a colleague, Cedric Pierce, who um, is the guy who we get all the fungi from. People often say to us as we're trying to develop something, they'll say, yeah, but it's too expensive to grow the fungus that way. Yeah, but today you can get penicillin for like six cents a kilo. Okay, six cents a wow. kilo, right? Wow. So, you know, if you put enough intuition and energy into it, you can figure out how to optimize something. And, and fungi, yeast are fungi. So human beings have been figuring out how to bake bread and make wine and beer and mead and things like that for thousands and thousands of years, right? So in the laboratory, we are fermenting fungi. And if we have a, a lead that's good enough, I promise you, I promise you, we will figure out a way to scale it up so that we could eventually give it to animals and then to human beings. So that's great. Yeah. And, that, and that's such a good point too, is like, you know, nothing's simple at the beginning, but as, as time goes on and more efforts put into scaling up and optimizing industrial production, you know, any of this is possible. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Nick, we've talked about your work on endophytes on, um, and I know that you're also not just working on endophytes, you're also looking at these libraries. Where else do you find fungi? Have you gone to any interesting places? I mean, I'm imagining, mm. you know, how, how do you go out into the wild and find? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fungi? Oh, I, I, had, I had forgotten you would ask a question like this. So, <laughs> You know, your listeners should know that you go off into the wilds of the world and collect samples. <laughs> so with fungi, the cool thing is <clears throat> there is something like, so if you compare plants to fungi, there's something like one and a half to five and a half million fungi in the world. And of those, about 130,000 have been given a scientific name. Mm. All right, just a genus and species. Wow. Even a smaller number have been studied for biological activity. And even a smaller number still have been studied for anti-cancer leads. So effectively, anywhere we look, we discover new fungi. That includes, we collect samples here in Greensboro, North Carolina. I mean, it's wow. not as urban as Atlanta, but it is, you know, it's effectively an urban environment. We collect samples all over the place and, and we find leads. So you ask, where do I collect samples? Well, I've got kids. My kids used to play soccer a lot. We would drive all over the state of North Carolina to soccer games. And during halftime, my son and I would go <laughs> wander into the woods. We would find a stream and he would jump in there. So one of the things we like to study are freshwater aquatic fungi, right? Hmm. So, so I always like to say that like if a stick falls in the forest, it's decomposed, right? And it's fungi that decompose it. And sometimes people call that leaf litter, like all that spongy material when you're hiking through the woods, that's leaf litter. My colleague who's got 50,000 fungi, most of his 50,000 fungi come from leaf litter from around the world. If that stick hits the ground, breaks in half, and half of it falls into a stream or a pond or a lake or a ditch, and the other half stays on land, it turns out that about 80% of the fungi in the water are different than those on the land. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so there is a little bit of a gradient, right? Mm -hmm. Streams get wider and narrower and, and things wash into the water, but there are these very unique organisms called aquatic fungi, freshwater aquatic fungi. And so they have been very poorly studied. In North Carolina, we've got mountains all the way down to the ocean. I have permission to collect in all the state parks. And so I'll take, you know, when it's not COVID time, a great way to get students in, engaged in scientific research, as you probably know, is to take them out in the field. And so we take field trips to a local state park and we will go to areas that have been, um, what's the word, changed by humans as little as possible. We try to hike upstream, you know, get away from where everybody's mm -hmm. camping and we effectively collect sticks. Right. So if you if you, you reach into the stream and you pick up a stick, you know, sometimes you bend the stick and it easily bends. That's probably a stick that's only been there for a little bit of time. But if, if you wait, if the stick's been there long enough and you pick it up, it'll kind of fly apart. Right. And mm -hmm. that's because fungi have cellulases and and uh, lignases and things like that that are breaking down the cellulose and the lignin. And so those fungi have evolved to be in, a, in an aquatic environment. They have like little appendages that make them sticky so they can stick to the wood. They have little appendages that almost make them swim. And they also make bioactive secondary metabolites. And so just about everywhere we look, we discover new fungi. Actually, I'll tell you, you were geeking out on a scientific name. In, the, in 2015, we published a new order of fungi. Okay, Whoa. so not, not genus, wow. species, not family, but up to the order level. In fact, when we submitted the paper, we were kind of conservative about it, but the editor and the reviewer said, you have enough data to say it's a new order. I always tell people that if we discovered a new order of like mammals, I mean, we would be on the cover <laughs> of like, you know, nature, right? But yeah. with fungi, they're everywhere. And that order, again, we didn't go anywhere super exotic. Uh, it was within 45 minute drive of Greensboro. Uh, and then we had some extra samples that somebody sent us from Japan. And it's sure enough, all the data lined up, new order of fungi, right? So that's amazing. That's like something like that's something that's like tattooable. I always said, like, my if I ever get a drug that goes to market, I'm gonna tattoo that structure on my body. Yeah. So like you yeah, should yeah. tattoo the order. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. That's I think I want the structure. I mean, I, it's got to go all the way, right? But uh, yeah, oh, we'll see. The, the bummer great. would be, though, if you did that tattoo and then someone says, you know, I, you got that stereo center wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That, would, that would be my luck. That would be yeah. my luck. So, yeah. so I, love, I love this perspective, though, of really thinking about nature and the, the intricate chemistries and pharmacological potential of nature that you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to find, you know, new things that could be something that, like you said, is in a, in your local park, in a Creek or in a tree. Yeah. And there's so much, I think that can be gained, especially for children and students to take the time to just sit and observe nature. I think that's, that's the, just, there's yeah. no better teacher than just to sit and observe and record and really think about how all these things are connected. Yeah, I read a book once. I forget what the name of the book is. There was a book that came out a few years ago that was popular about kids don't get in nature enough. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the title. But anyway, this guy made the point in the book that like, if you ask kids about the rainforest, they know about the decimation of the rainforest, but they've never been in the woods down the street from their house, right? So, yeah. and I, you know, I do think even if we don't discover the next drug, if we're out there collecting samples from a state park, the, we always clear, we always go talk to the ranger first so they know what we're doing. And the, the rangers appreciate knowing that somebody's up there doing science. They're taking a bunch of college kids from a public university yeah. up into the woods and doing some science. And so it's like an added benefit of why we have these protected spaces, right? And so, That's great. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. So That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun geeking out with you over chemistry and fungi and all kinds of cool natural products things. Yeah, thanks. No, it's been my great pleasure. It's a lot of fun. I've never done a podcast. So this is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that we're your first. That's yeah. great. great. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded on Skype remotely during the COVID-19 isolation period. You can find all of our episodes on our website at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also see a video of this episode and others on our YouTube playlist at Teach Ethnobotany. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.